The Douglas Coleman Show is made possible with support from Seth David Radwell, a recent guest on the program and author of American Schism, How the Two Enlightenments Hold the Secret to Healing Our Nation, released this past July. As Publishers Weekly writes in its recent glowing book life review of American Schism, Business executive Radwell's epic debut examines the historical influences that have led to what he sees as the collapse of politics in the United States. Seth Radwell makes the case that the current chasm between the American right and left can be traced back to the 18th century's Age of Enlightenment and the basic tenets of liberty, equality, and reason. American Schism provides a historical perspective that can help us fight today's unreason with reason and bridge current day divides. American Schism by Seth David Radwell is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and wherever books are sold. For more information, go to americanschismbook.com. It's time for the The Douglas 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 Coleman Coleman Show. Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators, the famous and not so famous, the controversial and the light and fluffy, we have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Okay, please welcome back to the Douglas Coleman Show for his fourth appearance, my brother in arms from the UK, Peter Abrams. Hello, Peter. Welcome back. Hello, Douglas. Thank you for having me. Like uh, like every modern-day film franchise, we got to three, and instead of leaving it as a trilogy, we thought, let's ruin this by doing a fourth. <laughs> yeah. Now, name one franchise that has done a fourth one that the fourth one was better than any of the others. Oh, yeah. Well, no, you test me. I thought you were going to say... The opposite, in which my immediate go-to is the Bourne franchise, Jason Bourne franchise, where they did three pretty good films and then made that fourth with another random dude because Matt Damon wouldn't come back and everyone was going, where's Matt Damon? And they just pulled some bullshit out of the hat going, oh no, he, he wasn't the only agent, we've got loads more. But in terms of finding a better fourth film than the others, I'm, I'm not sure. Oh, let's see. I'm not sure that there is one. But... Um... Death Wish 4 wasn't bad. I wouldn't say it was better than the others, but it was as good. Yeah. There's, no, there's, there's, there's a fourth film in series which is good, but to be the best out of all of them is really rare. I can't think of one off the top of my head. Yeah, because usually by then they've beaten the horse so dead that it just won't flop another yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, anyways, we, we're not trying to one-up ourselves on on the shows we're just lovely to have you back so we can catch up because it's been a while uh the last time you were on you were promoting another track or your ep right yes the ep is out now it exists in the world so how long ago was that that the ep the the ep came out in may god has it been that long may 14th so yeah wow it's been a been a good few months okay and the UK is back to somewhat of a semi-new normal now with COVID sort of in the background. Yeah, I mean, at the minute, it's it kind of feels the, the most normal it's felt since it all started. Uh, everything's open. We can basically do what we like. There's still like one-off establishments, which still have some rules and stuff in place. But overall, it's pretty much back to normal. The only thing we're still really being affected by is traveling outside of the UK. Uh, But the good news being you guys are finally going to let us Brits back in come uh, November the... I can't remember what date, but yeah, I know soon. I think it's the 8th of November. Oh, we are? There's something else I can can complain about. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Yeah, we can all come and... uh, (laughs) Uh, come back in which is good because i'm trying to get over to the states and have been for this whole time so i i'm looking forward to being able to do that you were talking about doing a speaking tour or something over here yeah yeah it's it's all ready to go it's all lined up and exciting we're going to do a whole traversing across the united states literally from west to east coast and uh, diverting off in between uh doing a mixture of my speaking gigs music gigs And just a bit of a like vacation style breaks in between as well. Are you coming alone or who who are you bringing an entourage with you? 
yeah, the band will come out as well for the, for the music shows, and then uh, it will be me and the band playing music gigs, me going off of a daytime to go and do some speaking gigs, and uh, and yeah, it's going to be really good fun. I've never there's a lot of parts of America I haven't been to yet, which I'm really excited to go and experience for better or worse. Well, it's a big country after all, you know. <laughs> there's lots to yeah. see here. Um, uh, great. Did you get sponsored, or are you doing this out of your own pocket, or what? Uh, well, with the speaking gigs, there's, there was interest from like colleges over there anyway, so that was like what kick-started this idea. Uh, but then the music's obviously taken off since we've last spoken, so there's there's a demand for it in a couple of states. So basically, we're going to do the music where the music's wanted, I'm going to fill in the speaking gigs around that, and then we're going to jot in between and see if we can get anything while we're out there as well. So sort of self-funded, but with the knowledge that there's there's listeners out there and there's there's colleges who want me to actually speak for, I'm not just going to show up and ask <laughs> any chance I could come in. Well, no, I mean, I'm, I'm all for artists getting paid for their craft, you know. And uh, that could be an expensive proposition for you to bring people over and... I assume you're going to hire a car or something. You're not going to hitchhike, right? Yeah, I mean, no. <laughs> that, that, that would be quite an experience. Yeah, we're going to hire like maybe a van or, a van. or something yeah. Uh, yeah. and just to lug all the stuff around, which will probably be the most expensive part is the car hire. <laughs> um, but backtracking for a moment, if you could, uh, if you could put your word of trying to get the artist paid for their work forward to anyone you can, that would be great. Well, I'm trying to think because I know some booking agents, but they 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 do music gigs. You know, I don't know of anybody who books speaking tours. No, and that's why when I do my talks, I kind of do them independently off my own back because I have it more experience in it than any sort of booking agent, which I could go through, if that makes sense. Uh, it's just easier directly when you're doing the speaking with music because you've got like the venue and ticket sales and everything to include as well. That's when the booking agent's quite handy. Yeah. Now the TED Talks is a uh, that's a franchised brand, right? TED. Yeah, it's it's like a platform where they they invite speakers to come and basically deliver innovative ideas. I believe is their cringy tagline, but yeah, um, yeah they offered. If I'd like to do one, December 2018, uh, did it, was great, uh, really cool experience. And since then, it's been a nice little logo that I can put on posters that make people think, oh, he must be quite good because he's got a TED logo there. Because, uh, um, you know, we're visual learners. <laughs> but they don't pay you, right? No, no, it's no, you don't get paid for um, you don't get paid for doing the TED Talk. But after the TED Talk, you can say you're a TED speaker, which I guess... Uh, like I say, open was further down the line, which you can get paid for. So it's kind of like an exposure thing. Oh, all right. All right. Well, um, I'll see what I can do. If you've got an EPK that's all glossy and nice, I would send it and uh, I'll see if I can. Yeah, you know. amazing. I've, I've got an EPK with my face on it. What more could you ask oh, for? Oh, great. Okay. So let me get back to COVID for a moment. Now, did you get vaccinated? Uh, yeah, so we got offered it because my dad is like, uh, not my dad's health isn't great at the moment. So he was like a person of uh, vulnerability. So we got offered it early. Um, they're now trying to roll out like boosters as well, which I'm not like overly keen on. Uh, I, the idea of a vaccine being, I thought that was enough. But uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're encouraging people to get boosters here at the minute. Um, but I had, I actually caught COVID in August and I had, I had it. Oh. Um, yeah, and it, it it was weird. Like we spent the last year and a half being so uh, told to be scared of this thing, but when you get it, for me it was it was a bit like a, a a flu, and you kind of sit there assuming it can't be COVID because the symptoms are too familiar to you. You know, you think COVID's going to be this totally different thing, and I just felt like I had a flu, and a test came back one day positive, and I was like, oh right, I've got COVID now, and besides the losing of taste and smell for a, a couple of weeks everything else was relatively normal whether that's my age or my health or whatever probably plays a factor but yeah so no i'm totally fine now as well oh well that's uh, i'm sorry to hear about your father and uh but i've heard that people that are young and 
basically good health that COVID is not a big deal. That it's just it's like you get the flu and uh, then you get over it. It's yeah, the people with experience. sort of compromised health to begin with that it's more serious for them. And uh, yeah, I, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was going to ask you if you had any side effects from the vaccine. Uh, well, I grew an extra arm, which was a bit weird. <laughs> but apart from that, it's all right. But I can juggle really well now, so it's all good. Oh, and you really, uh, you really didn't fall off or anything, right? <laughs> Not yet. Uh, okay. um, no, ev- everything seems to be normal for now. <laughs> Give it like 20 years and we'll see. <laughs> oh, well, that's good. I did see... Um, on your Facebook, there was a picture of you with uh, Russell Brand. Was that an old photo, or did you see him again recently? No, no. So since COVID's uh, calmed down here, it's been really great. We've had the opportunity to go out and, like, obviously perform again as artists, which up until, I mean, the last time we spoke, that definitely wasn't happening. So since the last time I was on this show, we've been gigging, we've been just being in front of an audience again, which has been great. And, uh, Russell's been doing a comedy tour and he's also been doing like well-being festivals, like mini one day festivals. And I've been getting involved with some of them, which has been really cool. Uh, I'm also in the very, very final stages of finishing off the next book. And so uh, I've been going and doing some like readings from that as well, which has been nice. So, yeah, no, that's been something I've been doing literally in the last two weeks. Oh, great. So a new book, Anti Self-Help 2? Yeah, pretty much. It's not going to be called that. I'm going to keep that uh, cause, mainly because I'm not absolutely 100% committed to it yet. <laughs> but um, I've got a couple of different ideas of how I want to sort of basically market it. The content is the same, but you realize when you've got a book, it's uh, it's no good having great content if it doesn't look good and people judge it by the cover, despite the famous saying. So uh, I'm, I'm still finalizing exactly how I want to push that but yeah it's it's along the same lines of what anti-self-help and our story called life are about uh but basically just a, a revised more streamlined version with some funny new stories and uh and I, I think it's probably the thing i'm most proud of that i've ever worked on because it's just it's it's really exactly what i wanted it to be um and with everything as i'm sure you know you know you do a great show but there's always parts of it that you go oh, I wish I'd said that. Or like when we play a music gig, there's always a thing where you go, oh, I wish we'd done that song a bit differently. Whereas this book, I've really taken my time with it. And where it currently is in its final stages, it's as good as I could have done it. So I'm I'm really excited to get it out. Well, I think that self-doubt thing would stick with people forever if you didn't just get to a point and say, okay, that's it. <laughs> Forget it. Absolutely. Co- Corey Taylor says when you're working on an album, to change your opinion from I'm an artist trying to record an album to just I'm an artist documenting where I am right now. Cause otherwise you could spend a lifetime sitting on music and going, when I get it perfect, that's when I'll get it out. But the ship sails, you know, the opportunity goes. Well, exactly. And I, I remember seeing a interview with Orson Welles, the great man himself. And he talked about Citizen Kane, which in many people's eyes, it was one of the greatest films ever made. And, mm. and he says, every time I watch it, I find something else wrong with it. So I stopped <laughs> watching it. And, you know, even even him was still mm. had that same ingredient of doubt in his brain that it wasn't really quite good enough yet. You know? Yeah, and I think that's quite healthy. I mean, it is you know, to you a point. It is to a point. It makes yeah. it makes you care. You don't just want to go right first draft. That was pretty good. Great. On to the next. Like it's nice to have that care, but I think there's a line that you have to not cross when it gets into like procrastinating territory. I think you need to set a time limit. Mm. You know, okay, I'll I'll allow myself to procrastinate for the next two weeks, and if. And once that two-week time period is up, that's it. It goes out, whatever it is, your yeah. book or your film or something. There's a good example of, of not doing enough procrastinating, in my opinion. And that was Paul McCartney's movie that he did in the 80s, Say Goodbye to Broad Street, I believe it was called, where, okay. where he wrote it, directed it, all the music was his, Ringo was in it, George Martin was in it. It was like a 
reunion of a few Beatles people, uh, right. save for George Harrison, I guess, who wanted no part of it. Yeah. And, and so Paul did absolutely everything in this film. And the film was terrible. And I thought it was terrible. <laughs> And later on, years later, I saw an interview with him and he said, oh, yeah, I should have had somebody else direct it. I should have had somebody do the second and third drafts of my scripts and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, and it just because he did everything himself, he thought, oh, this is a wonderful, you know, and it wasn't. I mean, he is a brilliantly talented man and I'm not knocking him for, you know, his tremendous contribution to the music industry but mm. he should have let somebody else direct the film and maybe somebody else go through the script doctor and it, it just he took on too much you know and I think that's where your ego runs away with you uh, yeah I think there's a part there's a there's a there's a part where as an artist you can get so lost in the creativity of something you can stop remembering to look at how that project is being received by people uh when you're writing a song or whatever you're doing i think it's always important to remember how is this going to be received by others how how am i coming across what's their perception of me or the thing that i'm making and i think you can get so lost in the creativity that it just goes down a rabbit hole and then most people seeing it can't really either relate or take any inspiration from it and that's when these sorts of case studies appear <laughs> yes exactly true um i want to switch gears a little bit and talk about the the ted thing that you are yeah. uh, planning for america your invasion yeah. of america yep i'm gonna do it all despite what paul mccartney should have taught me i'm gonna do it all by myself <laughs> <laughs> well so what's the topic that that's really what I'm curious about. What yeah. are you going to be speaking about? So when I when I come into schools in the UK or wherever else I've done them, uh, I just go in and I speak to students basically about life. Uh, the school can word it to the kids however they want to word it. Maybe they talk it's exam preparation. Maybe they say it's about careers. Uh, but it's kind of up to the school's discretion to how they want to label it. But basically, I'm going in and talking to the kids and saying. First of all, my story, and ho hopefully that inspires them to see you can do a, lots of different spinning of plates should you choose to. Uh, but also just to get down to, to what they really want to do with their lives and try and give them some sort of practical help. It's not just go in and be super positive and you can achieve your dreams, guys. Just work really hard. Like, I'm not a fan of all of that shit. It's more like, right, let's get down to the real business. What is it you want to do and how are you going to go about it and can i in this time we have together point you or inspire you in a better direction than you currently are so we can tailor it around what the students need you know some schools might need like i say the students have said we're really stressed out about exams so i'll go in and i'll talk about how to remove stress and just try and tailor it but basically it's all to do it's all based around the, the TED talk and, and trying to rewrite your story, as I like to call it, but not in a not in an airy fairy uh, loose way, in an actual like practical. How can you actually implement positive change in your life kind of way? What do you do with with people who have unrealistic expectations? It depends what it is. I mean, you know, say if I walk in and some kid says I, I want to be a billionaire astronaut, uh, it, it's it's more about <laughs> it's it, it's not about shooting their dreams down and I, I definitely don't want to be the guy who uh who kills that uh inspiration but it's also about maybe having that conversation and saying so so what's the you know what's the follow-up once you've been to space and once you've been a billionaire well, why do you want to be it is more the point we get to of what is it about that ridiculous dream that makes you want to do so and and usually you get to the core issue of they want to be validated they want the attention whatever it is you know say they want to be a celebrity uh, it's like instead of focusing on the specific dream if it's probably a bit far-fetched it's let's get to the core reason why you want to do that in the first place address that and then keep your dream and go for it why not but also let's 
now we know why you want to do that understand that and then say what can you do to satisfy that in maybe a different way as well oh that's very smart yeah that, yeah that's very you know, smart just, it, if m the majority of kids these days uh in the uk six years ago if you walked into any room they'd say soccer player footballer uh, you walk into pretty much any classroom anywhere in the world now, and it's YouTuber or TikToker. Influencer. Um, influencer, which is fine. And you know what? Not even impossible. I, I have many friends who do that and earn money from it. But it's it's also reminding the, the people I'm speaking to that the millionaire, millions of followers influencer that you like is in the the, the 0.01 percent of people who actually do that full time, and even while they're doing it, it doesn't mean they're happy or content or stress free. Things in life that probably should take priority over any career. Uh, it's just they're the one that got that opportunity. So one doesn't mean you can't have a career doing that to a lesser level. And even if it is a lesser level, isn't that's still great? You're still doing what you want to do. But also, too, let's not ever forget the actual priorities that you should focus on in your life, which is the removal of stress, the acceptance of things we can't change, the things which will actually help these people have a good foundation for life, not, yeah, you could be a YouTuber, man, just work really hard. I'm sure it will work out. You know, <laughs> like it's probably not very helpful advice. Well, I always have this uh, sort of comparative, unrealistic expectation that I like to throw out there. I mean, you've seen my VE show and yeah. you've seen what I look like. I'm, I'm rather overweight and uh, about 60 years old. And I always have this funny one about someday I'm going to get up and I'm going to run the Boston Marathon and I'm going to beat those little 110-pound Kenyans, you know. <laughs> and it's just sort of funny because I know what would happen. I would get 50 yards down the road and drop dead of a heart attack. But yet there are those people out there who actually would think that they could do it, you know. And yeah. at this point in my life, even if I had that sort of determination to do it, I think somebody needs to slap me upside the head and say, what are you, crazy? And unfortunately, nobody will do that or very few people will do that because they don't want to wake you up from your dream. Yeah, and, and I think I, we've I, been. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, like I think we've been. Hang on, I, th I think we've been conditioned Gone. to, and and it's it's gotten worse, because there was a time when people would tell you that, and you would either fight to the death and claw your way up just to prove that person wrong, or they would be right and you'd give up and you'd go do something else, but this idea that. You can do anything if you put your mind to it is kind of a it's a double edged sword. It really is, because I've seen people who were minimally talented in music, who just kept going and kept going and kept going and was getting nowhere. And the whole reason isn't because of their effort. It was because they didn't have the talent to back it up. But what's happened now with Internet is that the people that have less amount of actual talent but are fantastic at PR and uh, social media and lights and whistles and just these fantastic websites yeah. are kind of making uh, En-ROADS because of that, not because of their talent. Yeah, I mean, it's a topic I talk about a lot. I, I say you can do anything, you, you can do anything that's possible to do. Uh, the important bit being what is actually possible. Uh, this is what anti-self-help talks about. I I've never been a fan of the the positive thinking attitude, not thinking positively, but this sort of self-help culture that has bled its way into society because in the long term, it doesn't actually benefit you because it, it, it gives you this idea of reality that uh, it's an you're illusion. in control of everything. Yeah, it's an illusion, and, and and you're not. And there's a great there's a great diagram where, on the x-axis, uh, you have your ambition and what you want to do, and on the y-axis, you have what society will allow you to do, and you know all the pushbacks and obstacles that come with it. And actually, instead of the line going straight down, your ambition and uh, 
suggesting you just achieve everything you dream of it kind of goes perfectly diagonally as in you you push really hard and you try really hard to do what you want to do and society and the world and all the obstacles push back against you and you kind of end up somewhere in the middle of that that's a more (laughs) accurate representation of how people's goals are uh, the problem being is that, uh, you know, like I say about the music industry, uh, it's failures cashing in on dreamers. Uh, all the hopefuls who haven't had their go yet are basically paying money to people who never made it under the illusion they can get their, get them somewhere that they can't do themselves because there's such a lack of education about the business side of art, the art business. Um and so it is fascinating. And yeah, for me, the, the over positive thinking doesn't actually benefit. It's nice. It's a nice it's a nice thing to tell yourself. And it's a nice comfort blanket. But at the end of the day, if you want to see real gradual improvement or change, you have to focus and work on what you can control. Because putting effort and time into anything you can't control will always produce the same result. And the same result might be good. It might be bad. But the one thing it always will be is out of your hands. Therefore, you shouldn't focus too much effort on it. You should redirect that to where you actually have influence. And that will give you the best chance of ending up somewhere where you'll be content with. You know, you might start off trying to be mega rock star and end up where we're at as current affairs, playing shows and and having a nice little community and be content with that. And maybe that's enough. Again, like I say, relating it back to the kids that I speak to when it's when it's over positive or a bit far-fetched it's let's get to the core reason of why you want to do this why do you want to be a youtuber why do you want to be famous the answer is because we 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 are bred into a culture that (laughs) promotes us to be like that because that way there's more money to be made uh you know the the industry isn't isn't made from the success artists it's made from all the failures that's where the profit is um and it's getting to the core reason of why of why do you want to do that in the first place? And then it comes out, you know, I was never paid enough attention as a kid, so I'm basically a, li- <laughs> a grown-up attention seeker. And it's, well, uh... okay, maybe we can change that narrative to you are enough how you currently are. And then the kid goes, well, actually, yeah, and I do really like to work with people, you know, socially. And then you go, and then they start seeing a, a better avenue for themselves to head down. Mommy didn't love me enough, and that's why I want yeah, to be an well, influencer. Bo, Bo Burnham's got a great song called Art is Dead, which is about how every piece of art you ever hear is basically just a commodified, perverted version of its pure form because there has to be the goal of profit at the end of it. Um, and how every every artist you like or have ever liked is a kid at a birthday party who, who thought it was about them when it wasn't their birthday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. I also like that one you said about failures cashing in on dreamers. That That's very succinct. That, that puts it right there. And, it's crazy. Yeah. The amount of people I know who will pay hundreds and hundreds of pounds, which would be even more hundreds of dollars, to people <laughs> who have no real, no real... Uh, resume of any sort of you know validity but they'll they'll pay it because the the person said to them oh yeah i wrote this song with this big artist one time and if you pay me six hundred dollars i'll write a song with you and i look at that and and it's so illogical but artists are so desperate to stand out and and to make it that they'll pay it but they're not paying it off of sense they're paying it off of hope uh which is which is sort of tragic and expensive um and it's it's it shocked me more than anything existing in the music industry just how badly the the business is run and everyone says it's awful but when you actually get in it yourself you look around and go it is bad and there are you know people screwing people over but there's also a lot of bad business decisions being made by the artists themselves that's very true okay well i think on that note let's take a break and we will come back with peter abrams you're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on the Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. Douglas Coleman's Don't Do a Podcast is a dryly humorous rant about Douglas's pet peeve, the unrelenting torrent of podcast hitting the web on a constant basis. 
As technology has put podcasting within the reach of anyone, many wholly unqualified people have taken the plunge. This witty polemic tries to persuade them from broadcasting their drivel using Douglas's brand of sarcastic humor. Now on Amazon, only 99 cents. DJC Music and DJC Productions are pleased to announce a brand new website. We have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests. This is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of The Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Are you an independent musician? How would you like to have your songs played on hundreds of radio stations just like the one you're listening to right now? Join MusicSubmit.com and we'll promote your music to radio stations and blogs in your genre. It's free to set up your account and we guarantee your music will be considered for airplay by radio stations worldwide. Why not sign up today? It's free. MusicSubmit.com. Radio promotion for indie musicians. Hey, hey, this is Ray Powers. Don't touch anything. You've got it right where you need it. Tuned in to the Douglas Coleman Show. You heard me. Okay, and we are back with Peter Abrams. You know what? You, I learned something today. I learned that there is actually a connection between your book and my book. And here's a great opportunity for us to shamelessly plug our respective books. Your an- sissy, here it comes. Yeah, your anti-self help book, which I love, by the way, and I've always have. Thank you. Um, there is a connection between that and my little pamphlet book called "Don't Do a Podcast." It's the same theme, <laughs> basically. We we take it from different places. You did it from the sort of uh, snake oil salesman, charlatan, guru, sages type people who think yes. they have the answer and are going to share it and spread the love and the joy when all they're doing is taking your money. Mm-hmm. And with with my book, it's people who really don't have any business trying to do a podcast when, uh, you know, the, the bar has been lowered to the floor for that <laughs> <laughs> particular uh, <laughs> endeavor. And anyone, you know, can do it. But it doesn't mean that you should. Mm. And there's just so many really yes. bad podcasts out there that I think people ought to look twice. You know, if they're going to do it, do it seriously. Well, it's uh, it's uh, it's oversaturated markets, but of course it is. What is a podcast? It's entertainment. You're you're a host, and like we just spoke about in the first half. Uh, there's a there's an epidemic or a pandemic of of people wanting to be validated, wanting to be famous, wanting to be loved, uh, and that's the same thing with anti self help. That's the tie in is its lack of connection for people. They don't feel they're good enough, so they they want to start a podcast because that way they'll be adored, or they want to flock to gurus who have answers that they can't find within themselves. Uh, for the mere cost of a couple thousand dollars, uh, it's it's the same thing at its core. It's a lack of connection, uh, and that is the thing that ties them together. Exactly right, and unfortunately, out of the ones that I make the comparison with, with filmmaking, um, with writing, and with music, the three of those have sort of inherent built-in gatekeepers that sort of mm. keep people away who know better than to <laughs> attempt to do it. Um, you don't sort of wake up one morning and say, ah, I'm going to make a film. Because there's a lot involved. There's a lot of money involved. Even as cheap as it is these days with digital imaging, yeah. you've still got to have cameras. You've got to have a crew. You've got to have all kinds of stuff as well as a great script. Now, 
you're not going to do all that alone. It, it's absolutely impossible. So that sort of keeps most people away from doing that. Uh, for writing, again, that's a craft, and it takes time. It's a lot of effort as well. Yeah, yeah. and a lot of effort and a lot of redrafts and uh, re-edits and all this. And then with music, you've got to have the sort of talent initially. You've got to have some kind of an ear for music. You've got to have a voice. Yeah. And I think people know better that, uh, well, I don't have any musical talent, so I'm not even going to try that. But like I said, podcasting, yeah. if, it, if it was a game of limbo, the bar's on the floor. And, <laughs> but people are still getting under it, you know, somehow. And nobody thinks twice about it. You know, I just looked on listennotes.com yesterday, and it's 2.7 million registered podcasts out there. Wow. Yeah, I thought, oh, my God. That is amazing statistics. That is huge amounts of people. Now, that doesn't include the basement dwellers who are just doing it yeah, without yeah, being yeah. on. It, basically, if you put your podcast on any of the major platforms, it'll register on Listen Notes. So if you upload one episode to Apple Podcasts or iHeart or Spotify, any of those, you'll register on Listen Notes. Unbelievable. Wow. That is crazy. I suppose it's just talking, isn't it? So everyone thinks they can do that. Again, everyone can talk. Doesn't mean everybody should. <laughs> it doesn't mean everybody shouldn't. It doesn't mean everybody's any good at it. I've just had a really good idea to start a podcast. I've heard there's 2.7 million, so why not add another one? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's crazy. Like I say, man, it, it all comes down to that same thing of we just want to feel like we're worth something. We live in a such we live in such stressed out, bothered environments where most people spend most of their days at a job they hate with people they don't like. The idea of starting a podcast and people listening and actually giving a shit about them and what they care about is like the dream for most people. So I can't I can't begrudge them for that it just might mean it isn't very good but i suppose you can learn uh the difference is again why you're doing it if it's just to try and find an audience i think there probably needs to be more to it than that you know well to me a lot of it is just an extension of tweeting that's what it really looks like to me because people will will go on twitter and they'll mostly political crap which i try to yeah. stay away from but they'll take one side of the political spectrum and then they'll just rant about it. Oh, you know. Oh, it's echo chambers, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's echo chambers. And and podcasting has become an extension of that. Because That's instead really of having good to point actually, yeah. Instead of having to limit your rant to what is it, 140 characters or something on mm. Twitter, you know, now you can go on endlessly. And you can actually yeah four hours of <laughs> four why hours. the US moving their clocks back a week later than the UK is going to yeah. be the end of Western civilization. Right, I should I should start a whole sequence on that a whole sequence. <laughs> and I still don't know why. I mean, nobody has the answer to that one. I, we don't know. All I know is is my producer John said, "Did you notice that uh, we're not setting ours back till November 7? I was like, "Why?" Mm. Because it's usually Halloween. It's always Halloween. That's when it's done. Right. Yeah, I hate when the clocks go back at any time because it makes you realize that the whole concept of time is just an agreed upon idea. Uh, it's just crazy. Well, it's 7 p.m. now. Right. Well, now it's actually 7 p.m. again because of the sun and how the year's working out. And it's just like, right. So nothing's real, basically, is what we're confirming to ourselves here. Yeah. Well, actually, I take the other approach. I, I think that they should never go forward. They should set them back yeah. and leave them there where they are on standard time. The idea yeah. of daylight yeah. savings time is where I disagree. Mm. Because it was an an, it's an antiquated idea. The idea was, at least in America, I don't know why Europe started doing it, because we invented it. We actually do. Yeah, but we love just steer. We'll turn it into a holiday <laughs> soon, and we'll celebrate the American holiday of changing time backwards and forwards. Honestly, Halloween this year was massive, and Halloween's not really been a thing here when we was growing up, but now it's like as big as Christmas. It's crazy. Uh, so not yet. Maybe in a few years it'll be as big as Christmas when the purge actually becomes reality. 
but it is undeniably a big holiday in the UK now, which it never used to be. So the kids in the UK are going out in their little costumes and trick or treating oh, for yeah, all that. It's yeah, huge! Oh. It's a huge event now. Okay. Especially when you can post your photos of your kids in a pumpkin costume on Facebook, it means you have to show up to the party <laughs> and do your bit. You know? Oh, that's great! See, now that was something that was huge when I was a kid, growing up in the late '60s, early '70s. We used to prepare for weeks, months before Halloween to get our costumes huh. all together and go out and, and brought home massive amounts of candy. Now it doesn't seem like it's such a big deal. There was a uh, period... You've outgrown it. Yeah, well, I don't I mean personally, but um, I, don't, <laughs> I don't see the kids as much, and it doesn't seem like it's such a thing. And then obviously COVID was an issue. But, but before COVID, uh, what was happening in the 70s that sort of put a damper on Halloween was you had all of these strange, evil people poisoning candy and putting razor blades in oh, apples my. and things like this. And a lot of stories like that came out. And parents, rightfully so, were afraid, and they didn't want their kids out there. Plus these... Now, there's always a bunch of losers who have to ruin it for everybody yeah, else, isn't there? It's always know, the way. Creepy perverts riding around in vans trying to snatch kids off the yeah. street. Stuff like that was happening. Yeah. You know. So... Well, I'm happy to hear it's revived itself in the in the UK and in Europe as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's like I say, it's, it is a big event now. I'm just wondering when we're going to start celebrating Thanksgiving over here. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you guys celebrate the Fourth of July, that would be complete humility, I think. Well, I honestly, I could see it happen. Tesco will start selling fireworks that they didn't sell for November fifth and go. No, 4th of July, it's actually, it's a holiday we do now, and the UK market, we're going, yeah, fair enough, another reason to not be miserable today, we'll take it. So you're going to celebrate losing the war, yeah, that's Yeah, great. that's that's such a British <laughs> thing to do, isn't it? Well done, we all tried hard, you guys won, we lost, that's okay, better luck next time, cheerio. <laughs> <laughs> this is the world we live in now, yeah. Well, actually... We've decided we're going to rewrite the history books because we don't like the idea of winners and losers. Everyone's going to get a participation medal there for competing go. in the wars. There you go. And uh, we're all going to celebrate equally. <laughs> now, there's a topic we can talk about. Yeah, we're all created cool. equal. That that was written into into our history. All men are created equal. Mm. And I understand what they meant when they wrote it because they were getting away from this <laughs> British concept of class where by your birthright yes. you were superior to another individual simply because of your bloodline and this yeah. was something that we as american patriots said no no we're not going to we're not going to buy that we're not going to have a monarchy we're going to have an elected government and we're going to give every man regardless of his class and status in, in society equal opportunity to succeed in the pursuit of happiness okay that was yeah, that's why i like that's why i like that's why i love your country man i think yeah. principally it's it's got a lot of good things going for it so that was the principle of it however yeah if you take it literally it doesn't quite work and it goes back to that thing i was talking about you know running in the boston marathon against a, a stick insect where it just yeah. It's impossible. There is no way that I could ever beat these people, okay? Because I'm too fat, I'm too old, I haven't trained. The idea that, oh, get out there and do it. You can do it. <laughs> you know, yeah. this, this thing about all created equal. No, we're not. Some people are better singers than other people. Some people are better athletes than other people. They have different skill sets. And you should do what yeah, I think as, you enjoy doing, but you should also do something that is realistic to the skill sets that you have been afforded. Yeah, when we're when we're talking about reforming society and making positive change for our communities, we still need plumbers. We still need electricians. We can't all be absolutely airy mm. fairy thinkers. You know, there is a reality aspect to it as a practical part. Um, I think everyone's created equal in a in a humane sense. No one has the right, you know, to 
spiritually, I suppose you could say that's what they're referring to. But yeah, no, I, I'm in total agreement. There has to be a, a reality check to these things. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, you find out what I found out from the well-being industry. Everyone's a damn author. Everyone's got a freaking podcast. Everyone's a guru. <laughs> and actually, no, no one's left to be a customer. <laughs> everyone's just sitting around waiting for customers to show up because everyone's got a retreat they need people to go on. Here, here. And and let me just clarify what I meant by what I said. No one is better than anyone else. No one is superior yeah. to anybody else simply by what they do or how much money they've got in the bank. Uh, I, I certainly don't feel that Jeff Bezos is superior to me. He's certainly richer than I am, and he's richer mm. than just about anyone on the planet, I think. But uh, well, he's not—he's he's not on the planet anymore, Douglas. He's in space now. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, good. They can keep him. But yeah. <laughs> but he certainly isn't superior. I, I don't believe that. Okay. Well, instead of the instead of the instead of the bloodline of uh, queen lizards or whatever we've got over here, uh, it's it's financial, isn't it? There's a financial class system which is uh, yeah. Well, that's sort true. of yeah. Yeah, you know, Russell's got a brilliant bit in his new show where he talks about cults and how every cult starts with a good idea but ends up turning weird and then, and and then falls victim to one of the typical cult things of mass murder or you know the leader sleeps with all the women in the cult whatever it is um all very jokingly saying you know he's going to start his own one and it's very funny but he does say a really great point of he says I'm already born into this cult where we're you know uh, disconnected from one another from a young age, told that everyone's in constant competition, and basically the cult of consumerism. He says, "I'm already in this cult. I don't want to. I've been in this one my whole life." I and, saw uh, it. when you talk about class systems, I think it relates quite well. I saw an episode he did with Candace Owens, and she was sort of taking the opposite side on one particular issue. I think they got on, but uh, it, they, mm. were, they were talking about taxing the rich. And and she was against that concept, and and Russell was going on about how he wanted the government to take away, you know, ninety percent or ninety five percent of Bezos's money. They were using him specifically. And yeah, I, I have to disagree with Russell as much as I like him, and I've I've enjoyed listening to his shows. I had to disagree with him because if you take somebody's money, who's got a lot of it. Most of those people, Bezos, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, their money makes money. Most of their wealth is stock in their company. So if you, for yes. if you force the sale of their stock and you take away all of the money, their earning power, you will never get another nickel from those people again. Okay? Mm. The one reason why taxation on income in, in America works as it does, is because we take $1 from 300 million people rather than taking $10 from 1,000 people. Mm. Because the m majority of the money that the government collects is from the middle class, is from the working class. And yeah. they may take less of it. But you, even if you took all of Bezos's on last count, was worth about $200 billion dollars. Now, and 90 some odd percent of that is in stock, Amazon stock, because he issued his stock to himself when the company started for free. And now the stock is worth 3,000 something per share. And he's got millions of shares. Okay. Yeah. So there is no point to take the money, and it's only a drop in the bucket. Even if you took all of his money, 200 yeah, no, it's billion a, it's a, is nothing it's for a the great government. point. When uh, it's a great point when Russell talks about that thing. I think what he, well, I, I, I don't want to speak for him, but I believe the idea he's basically touching on is that not so many people should have so much if so many have to have so little. That's kind of the angle he comes from, which I totally get. Uh, I think that what I love about his show, your show, uh, and actually the life I get to lead at the moment, speaking to so many different people, is I'm in a real great position at the moment where I, I sorry, I say the reason I love his show and your show is you speak to so many different people from so many different walks of life and there's never, you know, it's never, 
you never invite a guest in and i find russell does the same guests are never invited in with this like predisposition to and we're going to shit on them and we're going to try and bring them down and destroy them there's a real desire to have a conversation and to learn and understand and to find common ground and i love that and like i said i've spoken to so many people so many different walks of life in my next book i've got conversations and interviews with everyone i've met from professors to porn stars the whole shebang and i i love being able to have these conversations with people and find out what we have in common with one another because like i like to say change can only be found on common ground the the longer people spend on opposite sides to each other the, the nothing will ever progress from there it has to come from a, a shared belief which yeah i i like that that these sorts of conversations have that regardless of politics or religious views or whatever label you could choose to uh, differentiate people between finding the ones which keep people uh, together is what I love through these sorts of chats. Well, I agree with you about his show too because I, I love that he extends his hand rather than a gun, and has just all sorts of different people on, and treats people with dignity and respect, and not to have, like you said, to have them come and just shit on him. And unfortunately, well, I see that uh, with, the, uh, with the major network talk shows. They already have a pre-assigned yes. agenda. It's ridiculous. They it's never used to. Popular. It, it's, it's why they're dying in front of our very eyes. It's why, the, it's why Joe Rogan is, is listened to more than mainstream news is now. Yeah, because exactly. It, 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 it's, it's real. And even if it's things you don't agree with, the amount of time someone's been on Russell's show, that if you said to me they're going on it, I'd go, well, I don't agree with them. But even if I don't agree with everything they say, there's some things they will bring up that I go, do you know what? I understand that. And actually, I I appreciate the point you're making there. That's that's learning. That's growing. That's coming together as a collective and, and finding better ways to move forward. We have this awful habit as humans where we spend the first like 15 years of our life forming the world of who we are and what the world is. And it's very changeable and in flux. Then from like 16 onwards, we spend the rest of our lives trying to defend what the world is to everyone. And I think we lose it. I understand why we do it. And it is a necessary behavior. But we, we are a bit too uptight about it. You know, we need to be more open to receiving ideas and, and being open to conversations, which is why I like coming on this show. You know, it's, it's always a good chat. And we always talk about cool stuff. I think those conversations are the best conversations and the ones most worth having. Compromise is something that has been lost in our political system currently. There is yes, no compromise. I agree. Everybody's drawing a line in the sand and saying, this it. And there's this big chasm between one side and the other. It's just empty. There's it's just a, a void. There's a brilliant song by a band called St- Stone Sour uh, called Absolute Zero. And it's basically about how he's pissed off with everybody from every side because they're all just ignorant bigots. And actually, <laughs> he's going to sit in the middle and be fucking furious because he doesn't want to be on either side because you're both so fucking useless. Uh, and it's absolutely brilliant. <laughs> oh, I agree with him. Although he's going to be alone there for a while. But uh, yes, because there yeah, are but again, a lot. Once, there's a few of us. There's a few of us. Yeah, and, and and honestly, the, the the people I'm seeing in my life through these festivals, the amount of people waking up to to a better way of living for themselves, to understanding and seeing through this bullshit is is inspiring. You know, you don't see it when you scroll on Facebook because that's not what the algorithms show you. You don't see it if you watch the five o'clock news because it's the last thing they'd ever want to admit or show. But the amount of thousands of people that I've had the privilege of meeting over the last since covid's allowed us to who are really changing their lives and in turn changing others around them in their local communities it is inspiring so i'm feeling really positive coming out of covid but that there's going to be really positive changes in a lot of areas in society i hope so there has to be something yeah. positive to come out of this awful 18 months that we've all had to endure yeah, because otherwise, what's it all been for? Just to go back into the same bullshit. I, I wrote in the, in the new book, you know, I, I wrote something along the lines of, we know now, we know it's a choice when we go back to the escalators and the lanyards. We know this is a choice of how we're spending to use our time, our very, very 
feeble, fragile time on this planet. This is what we're choosing to do with it. No wonder we're all feeling a bit crazy. No wonder more people are uh, choosing to quit their jobs. I know a lot of people have lost their jobs, but no wonder a lot of people are choosing to quit their jobs because uh, they've never they've never had a chance to breathe. And now that they can, they're going, hold on, what the fuck am I doing? We had a thing in the UK called furlough where everybody didn't have to go to work and got paid 85% of their salary. Yeah, we did that. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and so it's kind of like everyone's... So you're sitting in lockdown going, oh, hold on a minute. You're telling me we could have done this the whole time and my job's pointless and basically this company will be fine without me. Great, but not very motivating for when you've got to go back. <laughs> no, um, that's and, been and a that's, big, that's big that's issue here. Thing. You know, there's, yeah. there's, there, there's more than two ways that you could run a society. There's more than two ways you could run a business. Uh, the two choices we seem to have to choose between, which are basically the same anyway. Uh, the, the, the metaphor I like to use is, uh, not metaphor, but the, the analogy I like to use is, it's like with music. You don't listen to the Beatles, and if you don't like the Beatles, your other option is a trash can on your head while I bat it with a massive metal baseball bat. There's loads of other options of artists that you can listen to. And there's loads of other ways you can live your life and do things differently uh, other than the options you get sold or told. And anyone who tells you it can't be different has an active interest in you staying where you currently are, whether that's a boss or a company or a business or whatever, uh, they want you to stay there so they're gonna say well no sadly that's just a naive nice idealistic idea it's not you can change your life and you can live a better one not in airy fairy space land with jeff bezos but in a real slow burning practical way where day by day you can make gradual improvement and and get to where you want to be and that's what i try and stand for and deliver as and when i can what were you like as an eight-year-old child I was a weird kid. <laughs> if you I, can't I can tell. imagine. <laughs> yeah. Do you know, Douglas? I, I I have I still have notebooks to this day, and I kid you not, I'll send you some screenshots of like when I'm like eight, nine, ten years old. Me writing down ideas of imagine if you could build a machine where you could basically put people in like a video game, and they could live out a really fun life, and it felt like real life. Or the best one I can remember is I used to say, "What if God?" isn't like god we get taught at school but like something that made us and then like a relay race passed the baton forward and we've taken it and that was, was sort of my 10 year old brain which meant by the time i was about 15 i was going a little bit mental but at the minute i'm, I'm in a healthy relationship with myself so it's all right <laughs> did you drive your teachers crazy you must have. Yeah, I was, I was, I was strange. My parents took me to see a doctor to make sure I was okay. Really? Uh, because I was, uh, uh. yeah, but I, I was just, I was so erratic, and uh, they wanted, you know. I think my mum was thinking, okay, I've never really thought about God before, and now my son's asking me what is the concept of it, uh, and he's seven, so maybe uh, we should. <laughs> They didn't put you on right. on medication, did they? No, they didn't. Which uh, I'm glad. I'm glad yeah. they didn't. I, I don't yeah. think my parents would have allowed that. They've been very supportive. My mum and dad have been amazing. I'm very grateful. They've allowed me the space to to think about these things. But it, it wasn't all just deep thoughts. As a kid, I was very, very uh, anxious, very anxious, and uh, extremely uh, emotionally up and down. Um, that was something I had to work through in, in my like teenage years. Uh, and that fueled a lot of what I've gone on to do now. And it's partly why I still like speaking in schools and with young people, because I, I feel like I can still take myself back to how a lot of them are feeling. But yeah, my anxiety was like through the roof when I was, when I was younger. Well, but, but good things happen because number one, they didn't put you on medication, which would yes. have probably destroyed that creative drive and that sense of awareness that you have, uh, those meds tend mm. to just turn people into eggplants. And yeah, just it's a crazy, isn't it? And the other good things is that you're not dead and you didn't end up in jail. Well, Russell likes to say, he looks at me and thinks like, uh, well, he says, first of all, I could have gone down that path of like crazy uh experiences and he also likes to say i could have been his kid had he uh 
accidentally impregnated Katy Perry. <laughs> <laughs> no, but people with an amazing ability mentally to sort of see things for what they really are and to cut through all the crap uh, tend to have a lot of issues with it because you're the only one who is seeing this and everyone else is going, no, no, you know. Yes. And do you the, know what that the, the sheeple, what you just said? Yeah, the, yeah. yeah, what you just said totally summed up the first 18, 19 years of my life. And I appreciate I was young and I appreciate all of that. But that feeling of like, I feel like I'm the only one who thinks like how I think is exactly to a T how I felt for the majority of my life. And it's only been through the likes of meeting Russell and being given these opportunities and, and building this sort of little uh, foundation I've got at the moment that I've connected with other people and gone, do you know what? Not only am I not the only one who thinks like this, most people at their core feel this way and most people want the same thing. And actually what I'd like to do is try and help people see that because it's always been clear to me, it's, it's always been evident that we waste so much fucking time that we don't have to waste so much time. And it's not about me being 23 and a musician or you being 40 in a desk job or you being 60 with a podcast. It's about the shit beyond that. It's about the, the stuff that binds us all together, not in a left side of politics, like we're all one way, but in like a, we're the same fucking hairless monkey in shoes. We're existing in a weird society which is built upon ideas which we've all just agreed upon. You yeah. know, I, I love yeah. the phrase, there is no United States of America, but the idea of the United States of America and 300 million people, uh, that's how it exists, is because everyone shares the same idea. But yeah, I, I totally felt like I was the only one as a young person. And at the moment, and as life's progressed, I, I start to see actually everyone feels like that in a little bit of a way. Just so many people don't know how to express or change. And that's what people really want is access to change. But what everyone misses is the power to change is within every single person. It's just finding a practical way to start doing that. However, that relates to you and where you were born and what you find. You express yourself through a podcast. I express myself through doing various different things and coming as a guest on your podcast. The nice thing is that we're doing the podcast. <laughs> well, what you had obviously figured out when you were eight or nine years old, a lot of people on this planet will never figure out. Because, yes. and, and I'm not blaming them, because it could be the force of circumstance of being raised and living in dire poverty, where the only yeah. thing that they have to do every day is to find enough money to buy food. And they don't have, they can't afford the time to think of all of these deep things that you were doing when you were eight or nine years old. So that's a good portion of the population of this planet. Um, so I don't really blame them, but the ones that I criticize are the ones that have all the advantage and yet still live in that kind of cheap uh, matrix <laughs> type okay, yeah. environment. No, I, I, do you know what I mean? They're I just the battery. Saying. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. No, I, I do agree with that. I, I, I see where I changed from being a, a, a younger person who felt like I was a group of one. Now I see it as like a, a privilege and I'm very, there's gratitude that I, I'm able to know who I am, know what I want to do, be content with who I am as a person. Like, but it, it comes from gratitude now as opposed from anxiety or like fear or unknown. But I, what you're saying, I do agree with. I, I feel like so many people are lost in the bullshit rat race cycle. Yeah. Uh, and like you say, some for the majority of people, it's not their fault because they don't know any better. Um, but that there is there is a flip side to that of actually some people should know better and they don't. <laughs> well, that's um, the ones. I try. That, yeah. Yeah. I try on a good day to say, well, you know, the thing I can control is my interaction with these people, and so I try and focus on that bit of the equation and quite honestly i'll even take it one step further you go to the people who are just struggling to get enough food to eat those people tend to have a better connection with the spiritual life than the people who are all obsessed with their money and their worldly possessions oh. and i mean it's i know it's 
a, a very simple thing and it's been said many times, but it's true. So the ones that should know better but don't, as you said, those are the ones that I really take issue with. Absolutely, but you're, you're right. I've been to places in the world and met some amazing people that like laugh because they're 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 basically what in what we class as poverty and they couldn't be happier and when i'm saying goodbye to them as as i'm at the airport they laugh at me and go bye enjoy your matrix (laughs) you know (laughs) they don't want it they don't want to be part of it exactly yeah exactly right and the people that can afford to leave the matrix haven't a clue how to do it no well they're probably the ones most sucked into it because to be in a position of financial power or comfort within our world tends to suggest you're probably quite far into the matrix most of the people who are totally removed from it don't have any monetary wealth behind them really on average well it's it was that guy what was his name the one that uh, made the deal with the matrix devils and was eating steak and he says i know this steak is not real but it tastes so damn good you remember that one scene Oh well, yes, I do. And and he kills a couple of them or something. I forget his name though. I forget the character. Yeah, name. no, I know, what I mean, but it's true. But it's that it's guy. True. It's, it's that guy. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I think on that we should wrap this up. I think we got just enough time. Otherwise, we're going to go into Peter Abrams five, which five. Oh, well, see now, <laughs> this four, four yeah. didn't rack in as much at the box office as you want, but in five they bring back the actor which they couldn't get for the fourth one it's an absolute belter so five's going to be unbelievable well we look forward to five five states yeah. franchise yeah but we should we should Unless space we them like out fast and furious <laughs> we should space them out a little bit we don't want to run them you know back to back so let's yeah, wrap this one up with me always a pleasure uh let me know when you're coming to the u.s and when do you estimate you're going to do this do you think or do you have a date I'm probably, yeah, I mean, nothing, no specific date set in stone, but given COVID, given time frame, given the things I'm doing here, it's looking like sort of just after the start of next year. So February, March, probably April, March, April time in 2022. Oh, okay. Well, I think by that... all accounts, April's quite, quite a safe month to travel to def- different parts of the US. It's not too hot or too cold anywhere. No, the so weather will be good. Maybe that's just a lie. Yeah, you want to avoid Wisconsin in January and you want to avoid Florida in July. So somewhere in between yeah. those two dates is probably good. <laughs> All right. Well, Peter, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. It's a great conversation as always. And I look forward to number five.